I'd like to thank everybody who is joining us today and welcome to today's CNCF webinar, Challenges in Deploying Kubernetes on Hyperconverged Infrastructures. So two things. Um, yeah, we'll go back. Let me do our KubeCon slide. I do want to also remind everybody that KubeCon Cloud Native Con North America, our flagship event, and it is coming up in November in San Diego. It should still be very sunny, lovely in November. And this is, as many of you who have attended before, this is a time for the community to come together to further their education and advance cloud native computing. You can go to kubecon.io for more information, information, get your ticket, and we're expecting about 12,000 people and to sell that out. So before we get started, I'd like to also go through a few housekeeping items. Uh, during the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please, please feel free to drop your questions in there and the team from Diamante will go ahead and answer them throughout the presentation. Now with that, I would like to kick it over to Naren, who is going to introduce today's presenters and kick off the webinar. Thanks, Kim. <clears throat> good morning, good afternoon, good evening, folks, wherever you are, greetings. Um, so I'm Nareen Narendra, Director of Product Marketing at Diamante. Along with me, I have Naveen Seth, who is the founding engineer at Diamante, and Hiral Patel, founding engineer at Diamante. All right, so today, today we're going to take you through uh, the background of AWS EC2 evolution as an example. Hi, uh, Naveen here, and I'll be discussing the challenges uh, and some of the options, solutions, technologies available from network and storage end uh, when this transformation to these cloud native applications is happening, and this is from context of HCI platform. Uh, hi, this is Hiral, uh, and at the uh, last, I'll do a demo uh, for uh, deploying a container workload and also the virtualized KVM workload onto the same HCI infrastructure using the same Kubernetes cluster and we'll uh, wrap up with Q&A. All right, thank you, Hiro. So let's uh, take you through some evolution here for the next few minutes. Um, credit goes to the two stalwarts at Amazon Web Services, also known as AWS, Jerry Hargrau, who is very famously known as AWS Geek. Look him up as AWS Geek and you'll find uh, lots and lots and lots of beautiful pictures about how things work, how things are architected at AWS. And this picture, a, a part of the, this is a part of the picture from one of uh, Jerry Hargrove's uh, drawings. Credit also goes to James Hamilton, who is a distinguished engineer at AWS, been at AWS forever, and there's a bunch of uh, uh, publications that he has done through uh, MB Dorona and others that we are going to use today to walk you through uh, some of the <clears throat> evolutionary aspects of the EC2 uh, compute instance at AWS. So it all began this way for all of us, anybody in IT, this is a standard picture, right? And this is the crawl phase of what uh, Jerry calls it as for an Amazon compute instance. And this is specifically Amazon EC2 instance. And if you go back to history, the first incarnation of EC2 uh, came about in 2006, all right? And up to 2013, this was the constant picture for any compute node or host at AWS. And if you look at this picture, you know, it's got hardware, on top of hardware is software, software that runs networking, that runs storage, provides management, security, monitoring. There is a layer of hypervisor, and on top of the hypervisor, you deploy virtual machines, which are also known as instances. But in effect, from 2006 all the way to about 2013, um, you know, if you look at what James Hamilton has written, he basically sums it up in one sentence, which is networking is in effect in the way and blocking the efficient optimization of valuable resources in the data center. So why is this? A server is the most expensive component in a data center, on a, in a server and all the components that go into a server. And think about it, every data center in, for a public cloud provider like AWS, there's hundreds and hundreds of server in any data center. 
And if that's the most valuable asset that you have, something else coming in and coming in your way of efficient utilization means a lot in terms of the cost, means a lot in terms of the capabilities at, at which the, uh, they have to provide to the customers. So let's take a look at now and see how this EC2 instance is evolved over time. All right. So this is the big picture from AWS Geek, of which you know I took a part of it to explain uh, and kick this conversation off. And you can find this again at awsgeek.com. Um, so let's walk from the left-hand side or crawl from the left-hand side and try to walk by the end of it. All right, so what we see on the left-hand side here is the picture from uh, EC2 instance circa 2013, all right? In 2013, Amazon introduced the Nitro card or the Nitro system. By using the Nitro system, they offloaded the networking component, which was running in software, onto a hardware offload known as Nitro. And this Nitro system was built on cots, meaning commercial off-the-shelf components. And basically, just by doing this, they got 20% additional bandwidth on the network. And this is the C3 instance. So there's the evolution from C2 to C3. 20% additional bandwidth and 50% latency reduction. So your latency went down by 50%. Reduced performance variability, which means you could expect much more deterministic performance when you ran something, ran a virtual machine on top of the system compared to an EC2 system, all right? So that was the first technique that they used to offload the network, of course. You know, the taste was good. So next comes C3 instance, and that was one year later in 2014. And with the introduction of Annapurna at that time, the storage subsystem or the storage system which was running in software got moved to hardware offload. And that was also a cart system, meaning off-the-shelf system, uh, ASIC-based. And by now moving the storage component to the hardware layer to offload the uh, system, they gained 12.5% more compute out of the environment. What that means is if we have 100 data centers previously, they basically eliminated at least 12 of them. That's huge, huge, huge cost savings, first of all. On top of that, it's not only about cost, it's also about performance, it's also about latency reduction, it's also about QoS type of uh, treatment to traffic across the data center. So that was C4, all right. So now in uh, 2015, a year later, the EC5 instance was introduced and following the same suit, um, the management security and monitoring layers were pushed down to the hardware layer, again with another hardware offload mechanism. And do note here that by moving that, Amazon achieved a separation of control and data plane, which is very critical so that there is granular control of the system overall, and 100% compute availability. So. Essentially, again, more savings, more performance, more compute, which means more margins, you know, uh, more wiggle room to play with, and more applications to be onboarded onto the same infrastructure because of uh, higher performance. So there is a few things, though, that we need to, you know, compare and contrast here. By the time we got to the C5 instance, the Annapurna system, which was used for the management, security, and monitoring, was based off a custom ASIC, not COTS, all right? That's just, you know, that's what it is. That's what the picture says. As well as one other aspect here is the hypervisor layer stayed on from left to right. However, the hypervisor on the first three is different from the hypervisor on the right-hand side because the right-hand side hypervisor you know, is known as the Nitro hypervisor with additional capabilities to um, enable certain other applications to be run on the system. All right, so by separating the control and data plane, they also were able to easily uh, do billing of instances and so on. All right, so now so this is the evolution that's happened over a period of time. So in summary, you know, offloading, 
storage networking capabilities onto you know cards based systems or custom asic based systems provides us better you know reduces performance variability provides us with better performance reduces latency and so on all right so let's have that in our mind and and that evolution in mind and let's see um, how data center has evolved over a period of time. So here for your reference, these are the four uh, variations or uh, the form factors of the um, AWS Nitro cards. For your reference, there's the URLs, take a look at them at your free time. Uh, so now let's go and take a look at how data center looks today, uh, how hyperconverged infrastructure in a data center looks today, and what are some of the parallels that we can draw from public cloud providers like AWS and see where we can land or where we should be heading towards uh, in the data center. So here's a picture, and I'll walk you through this from left-hand side to right-hand side in the next uh, couple of minutes. And there's a little bit of a reality here, there's a little bit of a fiction here, and then there's a little bit of a reality here. So I will tell you why I am saying that in such a funny manner. All right, so let's start from the left-hand side here. So it's known as, first of all, hyperconverged infrastructure is the de facto uh, infrastructure that's being deployed in the data center today in every enterprise, in every uh, service provider environment for any IT workload deployment, all right? So with Hyperconverged 1.0, the pioneers of HCI, you know, uh, vis, vis Nutanix, VMware, as you all know, uh, started off by uh, packing networking storage compute onto a single node, a single server, and basically bringing more efficiencies in terms of packing things into a server. At the same time, the what we also observed with hyperconverged 1.0 is that host is heavily taxed in terms of utilization and performance. There is applications, application starvation. Uh, due to the way that virtual machines run on an hypervisor environment, the noisy neighbor problems persisted. SLAs could be only guaranteed to a certain extent or maybe not at all at some times. And it, it costed a whole bunch of money still to uh, deploy these systems. So, all right, let's keep that, keep that 1.0 picture in mind. Now let's take the learnings from AWS and say, and say what if we offloaded the networking component in an HCI 1.0 environment and made that HCI 1.5, right? So that is the second picture from the left-hand side. All right, let's fast forward. What if we also learned from the storage evolution in AWS and offloaded that onto another storage system in hardware? Okay, that's HCI 2.0. That's basically following AWS Azure uh, in terms of, and AWS in terms of Outpost and Nitro that you might have seen some announcements on, right? So if this is a what-if scenario where if we had offloaded both networking storage on to HCI 2.0, we would have gotten much more efficiencies in parallel with what AWS got with respect to networking, storage, and so on. However, hypervisor still remained in the picture. Not only that, let's also take a look at the current HCI solutions that we have in the market today, right? In all of the HCI solutions that are available today, the instance storage, which is also known as ephemeral storage, is always in a pooled storage environment. It is never in a local storage environment on the host. However, public cloud providers have been, have been able to solve this problem with hardware offloads and other mechanisms to actually provide an instant storage on the host. That brings a lot of efficiencies. That provides the QoS capabilities that is critically needed for a, a workload to run in the environment. So that's absolutely missing today, all right? So Diamante looked at these progress being made in the industry as well as the learnings that we picked up along the way. And we adopted the, these things right from day one in our approach to building the hyperconverged infrastructure for Kubernetes. So at Diamante, we have networking and storage offloads along with open source Kubernetes uh, packed, packaged together for a cloud-native infrastructure, all right? So with this, we are able to achieve 95% host utilization. The hypervisor is completely eliminated. There is no noisy neighbor problems. 
all those are taken care of due to the way the hardware offload works for both networking and storage. SLA guarantees can be provided uh, to as granular as 100 microseconds of latency and providing the lowest TCO at the same time. Now, not a, you know, if you look at every IT team out there, they're not given a white piece of paper every day or a blank piece of paper every day to restart their IT environment. They will always have a set of legacy workloads which may not be containerized at all, which are yet to be containerized. So they would need to run in a virtual machine-based environment. So how would we solve that problem? So in the CNCF community, you know, the community has together brought forward the notion of CNV or container native virtualization. And Kubebird is one of the uh, projects in this under this umbrella. Within Kubebird, the idea is to, using leveraging Kubebird, the idea is to run containers and virtual machine as equal citizens on the same infrastructure, which is Hyperconverse 3.0 plus here, uh, with Kubernetes as the orchestrator. And why is, why is this important? This is important because regardless of the workload, whether it's a container, whether it's a, a virtual machine, they both can be orchestrated using Kubernetes. They are a set of pod specs, and you, you deploy a container, you deploy a set of containers, you deploy a virtual machine or a set of virtual machines. It's the same mechanism, it's the same tool, it's the same learning, it's the same training that you need to have, right? And this is very important because simplicity drives efficiency, simplicity drives debuggability, simplicity drives a whole lot of things. And this is where the CNCF community is heading towards. And you might have seen some announcements uh, a couple of weeks ago from VMware in terms of taking certain Kubernetes components and uh, plugging them into the vSphere environment. Uh, the the most important aspect to observe there is that for anybody to run a virtual machine, they have to go through the vSphere uh, way of doing things, whereas when somebody wants to light up a set of containers, they will have to go through a different path, and that results in two sets of tools for two, dif two different workload types, uh, two different training, uh, training, two different, uh, you know, multiple um, training sessions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, that kind of comes in the way of simplicity, essentially. Now, with that background, let me hand you over to Naveen to walk through some of the critical requirements to uh, run containers in HCI environment. Sure. Hey, thanks, Naveen. Uh, thanks for uh, walking through the whole evaluation uh, uh, process uh, that happened over these few years. Uh, Let's now look at the requirements that came up uh, during this process, right? I mean, if you step back five years or so, container technology had just started being touted as the next wave of disruption. The way applications will be deployed and delivered, and this with oncoming change, the requirements for an HCI platform had to be revisited. So, so let's look at from just containerized applications uh, perspective, right? You have multiple applications uh, running. Uh, what are the new requirements from network and storage side from, from this perspective? You want multiple applications, but you want guaranteed SLAs for these applications from network and storage. You want consistency in performance, predictability in performance. So what does it map to? On network side, if you look at it, the technology had already started it was already out there. SRIOV was already proven. They were already off the shelf chips that could guarantee performance, that could give hardware cues to your application, right? These, these allowed you to program minimum guarantees, maximum limits at, at each container level, at each virtual function level. That virtual function could always be extended to container. Let's extend this on the storage side. Around the same time, NVMe started becoming standardized. So now you could have the same way you had it on networking side, you could have virtual functions, which could map to 
namespaces at the volume at the storage layer where you could have hardware queues for each of these virtual functions and then you could basically guarantee minimum guarantee as well as put maximum limits on each of these virtual functions basically meaning for each application you could guarantee a certain amount of IOPS you could limit a certain amount of IOPS now going back to referring to Narain's one of the slides this, evalu this evolution that happened there was a physical aspect also that was out there networking side the bandwidths were going from 10 gig to 25 gig or 40 gig 50 gig and even 100 gig with sub millisecond latencies similarly on the storage end we are talking about a million IOPS becoming very normal again at sub millisecond levels so with all this in mind now you have to really re review revisit how your HCI platform is going to look at. Move one year forward and Kubernetes starts getting a strong foothold as the orchestration platform of choice. From multiple applications running on a node, you are transitioning to multiple instances of applications running on multiple nodes and handling of uh, application fa failover is now part of the core design of this orchestration platform through different SIG groups, and CNS, CS playing, of course, an important role here, the CNI and CSI standards evolved. I mean, of course, flex volume being a precursor for this on the CSI side. And on the scheduler side, uh, a way to extend the scheduler, which was way more aware, could take decisions more intelligently based on its knowledge of the resources of the underlying hyperconverged infrastructure. So let's look at networking and storage side requirements that came up because of that. On the networking side, IP address or network endpoint being another way of referring to it, it should be dynamically manageable without the user having to provision it for each and every application instance that comes or goes away. But then look at the other way. There could be certain application that would require static configuration. They want an endpoint to be persistent with the instance of an application. Ability to have visibility of these endpoints at the network layer to allow monitoring or even enforcing policies. You want separation of control and data plane. You, want, you don't want your data plane failover to impact your manageability of your Kubernetes cluster. And availability to support availability zones itself, multiple data centers, campus clusters. Similarly, on the storage side, sorry about that. Uh, similarly, on the storage end, you wanted static and dynamic provisioning from storage perspective, from, from volume perspective. You wanted synchronous mirroring, where your applications would have persistent data across different nodes, and that should be synchronous. You, the application failover should not have to worry about a delta between the state of data across these nodes. You want rich feature set from enterprise customer's perspective. You want snapshots. You want ability to restore these snapshots. You want to take backup, and you want the ability to, to restore these, uh, uh, the state to the backups. And of course, availability zones should also be able to extend, the storage feature should be able to extend across availability zones. Now let's look at the HCI requirements for Kubernetes clusters from availability zones perspective. Now high availability zones from enterprise customers perspective normally maps to campus clusters. These are data centers not that far apart. Let's take around 50, 50 miles or so. Now the requirements are from network and storage a little bit different. On the networking side, you want your, your administration to be able to configure different subnets across different zones. So when applications are coming across up on different zones, they get IP addresses, they get endpoint assigned dynamically, automatically on the subnet where that application comes up. And the network should be laid out such that these are routable across these data centers. On the storage side, you want your mirrors to be created, to be placed 
across these zones so that a failover on one zone allows you to move the application to another zone and having the data available synchronously in that zone as well. Now, all this works very well for containerized applications. But what about applications that are still on this path of transformation? The yet to be containerized applications. You don't want to have a separate infrastructure to deploy such applications. And through KubeWord project under CNCF, there have been some great work done here. Ability to run applications in a virtualized environment, but inside a container framework, referred to as container native virtualization. On networking and storage perspective, you don't want anything to change from the way you did your cloud native application itself. You want the same feature parity. You want the same performance. And you want a single pane of managing these applications. You, you have learned Kubernetes already to deploy your applications natively. You want these applications, the yet to be containerized applications, to be also managed exactly in the same way. You don't want to le learn a different framework for deploying such applications. Now, stepping back. Given all these requirements defined for an HCI, the management of these components is also an integral part of an HCI requirement. Again, not very different from the offerings in the cloud, whether it be for configuration management, user management through Active Directory, or user policy enforcement through RBAD, should also be considered when designing or evaluating a platform for deploying cloud native applications under this new paradigm. So given all these requirements, are defined. Let's look at one of the solutions that's out there that does take care of all these feature sets. I'm going to give it to Hiro, who's going to demo, demo some of the features that we just now discussed. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Naveen and Narain, for the great introduction. Um, in this section, I'll go ahead and uh, uh, give a demo of uh, multiple demos. So there are three demos that I've set it up. First, uh, we'll go over uh, the setup that I'll be using it, uh, the Kubernetes cluster which is deployed onto the HCI appliance. And the same cluster we'll use to deploy a containerized workload, which is a WordPress application. That's an example. I'll use it to deploy it. And uh, we'll use the same uh, Kubernetes cluster and deploy a KVM uh, to showcase that yet to be containerized applications can also be deployed onto the same infrastructure using the same Kubernetes cluster. And in the fourth uh, section, uh, which will be the last demo, uh, in that one we will showcase the uh, benefits of hardware offloading for the network and storage resources and how we can use those benefits to provide the IO isolation per application, per VM instances, along with the QS for the performance. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the demo setup that uh, I'll be using it. So uh, I'll use a three-node cluster. Uh, as I mentioned, this is an HCI uh, platform appliance on which we have clustered the three-node Kubernetes cluster. Um, as you can see, there are um, blue and green components. Blue are all open source Kubernetes components. Uh, we have uh, one node, node one, which is running all the master components of the Kubernetes. And uh, the green components are basically nothing but uh, the, these components provide the functionality from the HCI platform standpoint to do a resource pooling for the network and storage standpoint, and also the CNI and CSI plugins to provision the network and storage resources to provide the guaranteed um, QoS, guaranteed performance, and making sure that you provide a IO isolation for each and every container deployed onto this infrastructure. There is also a scheduler extension uh, component, which makes sure that it is aware of what all the resources this given infrastructure is able to provide, um, making sure it is aware of whether it's a high availability cluster, um, whether it is a single uh, zone cluster, and making sure it is able to schedule the resources in a such a manner that it provides a high availability for a given resource from an application standpoint. Now let's go ahead and kick in the first demo, where I'll go ahead and deploy a WordPress application. 
before I deploy the application, I'll just give you a pictorial view of how the application deployment will look like onto the Kubernetes cluster that we have built across the three nodes. So when we deploy a uh, WordPress application, uh, which is running along with the MySQL, which is using a MySQL as a data store. So here I'll deploy a three instances of the WordPress, WordPress, which will be running onto the three instances, node one, node two, and node three. And we'll deploy a MySQL, which will be using an underneath persistent volume onto a DMRT IO layer. As you can see here, and we will go ahead and use a Kubernetes construct called storage class to dynamically provision the persistent storage onto the DMRT IO layer. As you can see, there are three um, disks are drawn onto the picture, green disk. Those are nothing but the three replicas of the persistent volume that MySQL will provision. These three re replicas are synchronously replicated. What does that mean? That means it gives a high, uh, high availability of the volume or data store onto these replicas for a MySQL to fail over in the instances of the node going down or uh, if the application MySQL instance itself goes down because of some reason. Now, DMIT IO layer also provides a way to take the snapshots of these replicas. Because these replicas are synchronously replicated, you can use either of the replica to take a snapshot into given a time frame. And these snapshots can also be used to back up into the third party backup storage like NFS or AWS. Now these backup can also be used in future to restore onto a given volume or also to create a new volume for uh, log analytics or any further uh, analytics that, uh, that uh, end user wants to do it. Now let's go ahead and physically I'll go ahead and deploy this uh, instance, uh, the WordPress instance. So as, uh, first, I'll go ahead and log in to the cluster that will be using it to do uh, uh, to the demo. So as I mentioned before, it is a three-node cluster. Uh, you're seeing a four-node, but fourth node is uh, using as a standby right now. We'll use this fourth node into the later part of the demo. So we'll go ahead and mainly use the three nodes of the cluster. You're seeing two CLIs here. One is a kubectl, which is the open source Kubernetes CLI, which gives you the uh, details from the Kubernetes cluster standpoint. And there is another CLI here is a dctl CLI, which is a DMRT infrastructure level CLI, which gives you the more awareness from the infrastructure resource and resource pooling standpoint. So here you will be seeing more information from the platform standpoint, like multi, uh, millicores, memory provided onto or available onto the server, storage, and uh, VNIX, uh, which are the underneath infrastructure level resources that can be used to schedule a specific workload onto a given node. Now let's go ahead and deploy the WordPress application. Um, here we I have three YAML specs. One first one is uh, nothing but a MySQL password. Uh, so we have created a secret for it, uh, MySQL deployment, and WordPress will be deployed as a stateful set. Let's go ahead and create a secret and deploy a MySQL deployment instance. Now let's look at into the details of uh, what is the pod spec looks like. So as if you remember from the uh, our pictorial way how the storage is going to be provisioned, we have mentioned that we will be using a dynamic provision and we'll use a storage class that is pro construct that is provided by the uh, Kubernetes to provision the uh, storage or pro provision the volume onto the DMRT. Here it says that storage class will be using is a mirror. That means we will go ahead, let's look at uh, what is this uh, mirrored storage class looks like. So here, as we see, we will be using an underneath uh, DMRT a volume provisioner. And this provisioner is aware of these parameters. These means we need a three replicas onto a given cluster wherever we, whenever we provision the storage. The file system it will be using is the ext4 file system. And this is the performance tier or guaranteed QoS that it requires is a best effort based. 
Um, we'll go into the details of the different performance tiers that uh, you can provision onto the infrastructure and how we are able to give the IO isolation and guaranteed QS into the later section of the demo. Now let's go ahead and deploy the WordPress stateful set. Now once the application, uh, right now we have MySQL instances running. So this is the WordPress MySQL instance that we deployed. And we had requested that we needed a three-way mirrored volume or mirrored replicas for a given uh, MySQL instance to be deployed. Now, if we zoom in into this uh, volume, which was dynamically provisioned, we will see that it has provisioned a three-way map replicas onto a three different nodes of the cluster. And these all replicas are synchronously replicated. So that means every write will happen to the MySQL instance will be replicated onto all uh, plexes or all replicas of this uh, provision uh, persistent volume. Now let's take a look at the pod state. Um, so as we uh, deployed one MySQL instance, it is into a running state. It is running into the node one. And we have three instances of the WordPress stateful set running because we have three node cluster and we had requested for the three replicas. So we have all three instances of the replicas running onto the three different nodes of the cluster. Now, Let's go ahead and uh, in this section, uh, we'll go ahead and deploy a KVM instance, which can be used to run the yet to be containerized application onto the same Kubernetes cluster. This gives us a view on how you are able to deploy the same, uh, how you are able to use the same node and also deploy the containerized workload along with the KVM workload. Um, here I'll just give, before we go ahead and deploy it, I'll just give a little, little bit deeper view into how we are able to achieve that and how we are able to use the same infrastructure to deploy both a KVM workload along with the uh, container workload. So in high level, um, if you are aware of the KubeWord project, the design is very much similar to the KubeWord where the philosophy is we want to run a VM inside a container. So they can coexist onto the same infrastructure along with the container workload. Um, in this, we are using a KVM as an, this, our solution is based off the KVM hypervisor. Uh, now looks like the KVM is becoming a default runtime manager for deploying the VMs. Uh, Nowadays, uh, like Google is using it, AWS Nitro cards are also supporting the KVM as a hypervisor to deploy the VMs. Uh, we will use the same Kubernetes uh, orchestrator to deploy the VMs uh, the same way it deploys the container workload. And based on the, because of the HCI and by offloading the network and the storage resources, uh, we are able to achieve the consistent IO isolation and quality of service for the both containers and the VM workload using the PCI pass-through mechanism. So here in the diagram, you are seeing two, um, two NIC components. Uh, one is uh, Ethernet VF and another one is a NVMe VF. So every application or every, every container or every VM which get provision onto the HCI adapter, DMIT HCI adapter, it gets an its own isolated or its own isolated VS per a container or per, v, uh, per VM. So here, let's say if the VM requires a network and the storage resource, both of them, both of them will get its own SRLV function for VS, uh, for network and the storage. So this gives you uh, the way of uh, provisioning uh, or make a consistent way of getting an IO isolation and also guaranteed QoS for a given application or for a given VM instance. Now this is a little more technical. I won't go into each and every component detail, but this is kind of a high level picture which gives you the details on how the same code path or same uh, Kubernetes orchestration can be used to deploy the pod, uh, pod uh, container or a VM instance onto the same infrastructure. So here there are two workflows which are uh, drawn. Uh, one, the orange one is a pod, regular container native workload. 
and uh, the red one is the KVM uh, deployment workload. So if we uh, so KVM deployment is here in this case is actually uh, implemented using a Kubernetes construct called CRD, Custom Resource Definitions. So KVM objects are exposed as a custom resource definition onto this Kubernetes cluster. So whenever a KVM object gets created, the custom controller, KVM controller, which is uh, in the green component underneath the API server will watch onto those instances and it will act on it. Here we are seeing uh, other uh, components like scheduler, network controller, and storage controller. So whether you provision, whether you deploy a container or you deploy a VM, underneath all the green components will be um, used in a similar manner. It is, they, are, uh, they are both same in case of provisioning the storage or network for the container or the VM. The code path will remain same. This gives us the benefit of having the same features like storage classes, dynamic provisions, for, uh, static provisioning for the storage and network to be exercised for both pod and the KVM workloads. So if you see at the end on the right hand side, the containers and the VMs are running uh, next to each other. They can coexist onto the same infrastructure just because we are able to extend the Kubernetes uh, to deploy the VM and the container workload onto the same infrastructure. Now this is the pictorial view of how we will how I will go ahead and deploy the KVM. So if you remember from the first demo, we had deployed a MySQL and uh, one of the WordPress instance was running into the node one. In this demo, I'll go ahead and deploy a KVM instance onto the same node just to uh, demonstrate that you can, uh, you are able to deploy the KVM and container workload onto the same node of the same Kubernetes cluster. Underneath IO layer is exactly the same. Uh, the way we will provision, in this case, I'll take an example of provisioning the persistent storage using a, a static provisioning, uh, just to showcase the static provision onto the Kubernetes cluster for the KVM. And you can still use the same storage features like uh, mirroring, uh, synchronous replications, uh, snapshots, and also taking a backup of these snapshots and restoring this backup into the uh, persistent volume. So as I mentioned, we have extended the K uh, Kubernetes CRDs to support a KVM as a primary object onto the cluster. So this is the KVM uh, CRD. And this is the custom KVM controller that uh, we have written to uh, watch onto the KVM CRDs being created onto the Kubernetes cluster and then take, on, uh, take an action on it. So when we talk about VMs, there are um, two things comes into our mind. The first is how we're gonna do the boot image management. How, uh, how it will be able to pull the images to boot the VM from it. So in this example, we'll use a web server based uh, uh, management for the boot images. So I've just deployed an Nginx web server onto the same cluster, which is hosting a CentOS 7.4 uh, QCOW image for VM to boot from. So this is the uh, Nginx web server which will be hosting the CentOS QCOW image. And this is how the KVM pod spec will look like. Um, as you can see, it is same as the pod spec, except the way we provision the network is uh, using an annotation and it will use underneath a CNI plug, same CNI plugin to provision the network onto the same infrastructure. Um, this is a static uh, endpoint because uh, for the VMs, you want to make sure the IP addresses which are allocated once they persist for reboot or uh, redeployment of the same instances in case of node failures or zone failures onto the same Kubernetes cluster. So end user doesn't have to worry about uh, IP address changes and node configuration changes and uh, things like that. Uh, as I mentioned before, we are using a web server base of pulling the image. So this is the HTTP endpoint from where the CentOS 7.4 QCOW image will be uh, pulled and booted. Uh, it will be used for VM boot up. Um, 
this is the way we are able to expose the uh, uh, reserve the resources for a VM instance. The number of CPU cores that we'll be using is 16, and memory will requested for 32 gig of memory. Um, today, there are two ways to access the terminal, a uh, serial console way or it's a graphical VNC uh, remote console way of, uh, graphical remote console way of accessing the VM. Uh, this is just the index for it to use it, for which index to use for the graphical VNC index. And here, these are all the same volume construct that you would, persistent volume construct that you would see it into a container, regular container or regular pod spec. Um, here, you, there are two persistent volumes we have specified. Uh, one is a volume images, and another one is a data volume, which is a volume one. Um, so volume images is the persistent volume that I will use to persistently save the configuration or the boot image. So the reason we want to use the persistent volume is once the VM is boot, booted, if the end user is making any configuration changes, like um, it is making any changes into rc.local or the way the application should start once the VM is booted. Uh, you want to keep those configuration changes persistent onto the persistent volume to make sure that they are persisted across the reboot. They are persisted if the uh, KVM instance moves from one node to another node or it moves from one zone to another zone. This volume two is the volume one is the data volume. This volume is exposed as a PCI pass through inside the VM. And we are using a block device as an FS type. And this support was added into the flex volume to make sure that we are able to do the PCI pass through for a storage, persistent volume storage, and also able to get the guaranteed QoS and IO isolation for the VM instances, same way we are able to get it for the container workload. Now we'll go ahead and uh, deploy the KVM instance using the same pod spec. Let's go ahead and provision the endpoint, which is the EP1. And as I mentioned, we'll provision the storage with the static provisioning. So we'll use a backend CLI to create uh, a persistent volume. This is a volume image one, is the persistent volume for storing the boot image. And this is our block volume which will be exposed as a PCI pass-through device. These are the two volumes that we just statically provisioned onto the cluster, and both of them we provision onto the node one where the WordPress and MySQL instances are running. Let's go ahead and create the PV PVCs to bound, bind this uh, volume. And now we'll go ahead and deploy the KVM instance. Now, as we see, the KVM instance is uh, created uh, under the KVM CRDs. And now custom KVM controller would have created the KVM pod for the given, CR, uh, given KVM instance that we created. Here, as we see, the same KVM instance, we deployed it onto the same node where we have one of the WordPress uh, instances running and also the MySQL instances running. Now, this is the IP address got attached or it was reserved for a given KVM instance. As you can see, it is underneath using an SRIOV VF for this given uh, instance. And these are the two storage vol these are the two persistent volumes that got assigned for a KVM instance. And as you can see, the first one, vol one one, was the block device. So there is no device path will exist onto the host because we are doing a PCI pass through. And in that case, host will not see this PCI device on the host, and it will be passed directly inside the VM. And second uh, instance, we are using for persistently saving the boot image. Now we'll access uh, using a serial console to the VM. And as you can see, you are able to log into the KVM instance that we just deployed. And we will be able to see the same IP addresses being configured inside the VM for the interface that we exposed as a PCI pass-through device.
okay now we'll move on to the uh, next demo which is the last demo of this uh, section we would like to do and i'd like to do showcase the io isolation with qs for performance which showcases the uh, benefits of uh, offloading uh, uh, both network and storage to the hardware and how you can get the guaranteed uh, qs or guaranteed performance for a given container or a vm workload so in this demo uh, so we have four node cluster uh, i just uncorded the node four so we will take advantage of using a four node cluster and i would try to deploy i would try to dedicate a node one for all the kvm instances deployment so we just use the same kubernetes construct to label the node for the kvm deployment just to make sure that you are all the kvm instances that we deploy onto the cluster only goes onto the node one and all the container workloads we will dedicate on the node 2 3 and 4 here we will uh, basically deploy around uh, uh, 27 containers across three nodes and nine kvm instances on node 1 and we will see how we are able to guarantee the io isolation and also the performance for a given workload kvm or a container workload using a hardware offload for network and storage so we just uncorded the uh, fourth node into the cluster so we have a four node cluster here we want to take uh, we want to demonstrate the use, uh, usage of a performance tier and the guaranteed uh, io isolation and the performance for the container and vm workload so we have divided the uh, we have uh, deployed a three performance tiers here one is a best effort high and medium as you can see their uh, reserved uh, storage iops for best effort is 0 and network bandwidth is 0 that means if a system has more uh, system has any to give they will get some uh, storage iops and network bandwidth based on the best effort uh, high is going to get the maximum which is uh, 20k and 500 uh, meg and medium is the next level which is 5k and 125 meg you can st uh, use the same construct to uh, get the maximum uh, to limit the maximum storage iops and maximum network bandwidth also but in this case we'll just uh, demonstrate the min requirement so these are the way of setting the min requirements for a given workload um i'll use this three uh, performance tiers and deploy a uh, three instances of kvm using a best effort three instances of kvm uh, using a high and other three using a medium onto the node one so let's go ahead and label the uh, first node as a type kvm and make sure that we use the same K, uh, kvm node label to deploy all the kvm workloads here the node is labeled as a kvm here in uh, this uh, we are deploying a nine instances of kvm which will be getting deployed onto the node 1 which we labeled as as a kvm node as we see there are nine instances of kvm crds we deployed and let's take a look at the container states as we can see the nine instances are going into the container creating state i'll just showcase a um, another uh, uh i'll just showcase uh, you the dashboard which we can you uh, which we can see to um uh, the applications or kvm instances that got deployed uh, so this is the dashboard from the infrastructure standpoint um here this is the application tab will be able to see it and just logged out i'll just re log in to the node okay while it is coming up let's go ahead and we'll deploy uh, the regular fio and iperf benchmarking containers onto the same infrastructure so here we'll deploy a uh, 27 instances of uh, fio benchmarking and iperf benchmarking pods across three nodes of the cluster okay 
Okay, so here is the way uh, we are able to look at the different applications. Uh, let's go and take a look at the nodes while the other container workload is coming up. As we see, we had deployed a KVM instances onto the node one of the cluster. Here, as we can see, because of the uh, hardware offload, network and storage hardware offload, you are, we are able to get a 1 million IOPS or more than a million IOPS for a given um, node. And we are also able to get a network throughput. If you see it, that is, in this case, we are not running, KVM is not running any network traffic. It is only running a storage traffic. So you'll be only seeing the storage IOPS and which is close to a million, you are able to get it just because of the hardware offload for the storage. As we see, uh, the all pods of these containers, yeah, here we see a nine KVM instances that we deployed using a different performance tiers, uh, three with best effort, three with medium, and three with high. Now let's look at the in other instances that we deployed. We'll filter onto a specific node to see a container workload. So here are this here are the three container workload for the FIO, which is a nothing but a storage benchmarking application. IPERF, which is a network, uh, IPERF is a network benchmarking tool. So as you can, it is still coming up. Once the application is fully able to drive the traffic, we will see a di we will see the numbers in such a manner that high workload will be getting the maximum IOPS. Uh, uh, available onto the node. Right of uh, next will next year will be the medium, and after that would be the best effort. So here, as we can see, we are able to see 240k IOPS, and uh, I'll go ahead and enable uh, performance tier to show that that was the performance tier, and along with the read and write latencies to see how much latencies we are able to. Uh, gain for a given specific uh, performance tier workload. So as we can see here, all the high workload are around the uh, under 500 microsecond latency. They're around 480 microsecond latency for a read workload. And as we can see here, they are in the, all of them are about to get 260K IOPS. Uh, we have a best effort which are running around the 16K IOPS with the higher latency because uh, you will be uh, make, giving the high priority to the higher workload. The hardware is giving the high priority for the high workload, which requires the maximum IOPS. And the next is the medium, which is getting a 66K IOPS and with the 1.9 millisecond latency. This is the same behavior we will see onto the other nodes where we deployed it. So here, as you can see, all three best effort are into their own range with high it getting the maximum and then the medium into the next category. So um, yeah, this is what uh, I had from the demo standpoint. Um, now we'll, uh, we can wrap it up with the Q&A. Thank you, Hiro. Uh, so there was a few questions that came through the Q&A uh, channel on Zoom. We've answered uh, all of those questions. Feel free to, uh, if you have any more questions, you know, feel free to uh, uh, plug them in now. Or let's roll to the next one as we're on the top of the hour. All right, so uh, if you'd like to learn more about Diamante, uh, go to diamante.com, email us at info at diamante.com, or follow us on Twitter at diamante.com, or we're also on LinkedIn. So in closing, thank you for your time. Uh, we appreciate it a lot. I uh, hope uh, we were able to share some uh, insights from the industry. Um, so in closing, Diamante is an enterprise Kubernetes platform with hardware offloads based on, uh, you know, uh, cards based uh, chipsets. It's a full stack solution with hardware and software prepackaged with open source Kubernetes with million IOPS for one RU and sub 100, 100 millisecond latency. Check out our website for all the use cases, solutions, of course. Um, also um, plan to attend KubeCon. We'll see you there and you can expect more from us at uh, KubeCon. So until then, have a great day.
Back to you, Kim. Thank you all. Thank Have you. a great day.